Are you looking to take your personal finances to the next level? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Monday Money Tip Podcast, presented by I Was Broke, Now I'm Not, with your host, Joseph Sangal. Well, welcome to the Monday Money Tip Podcast, presented by Fully Funded Life, where we help you, yes, you, live a fully funded life. And man, I am fired up on episode number 231 here at the start of the last month of the year. Can you believe it? The month of December is upon us. And so I am so excited about today's episode. Today's episode is with a special guest. From time to time, we love to bring you interesting people who've had a great uh, success in their money journey so that you can learn from them. So you're not just hearing about stuff from us from an educational or theoretical or book side of things, but from actual practitioners of real, excellent money decisions. And so today's guest is Pastor Luis Garcia. And I'm titling this, Do Not Despise the Small Beginnings. And I want to welcome Pastor Luis. Pastor Luis is a pastor on staff at True North Church. And that's in the area of Sewell, Mantua Township, New Jersey, just across the river from the runner-up uh, oh, World Series man. players, the Philadelphia <laughs> Phillies. Welcome to the podcast, Pastor Luis. Uh, hey, Pastor Joe, it's an honor to be here. And uh, and I, you know what? I should have seen the Phillies comment coming, but <laughs> it's all good. I'm glad. Hey, it was a great year for you guys. <laughs> it was a great year uh, for the Phillies, no doubt about it. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And, uh, and, and in a lot of ways, you have been a spiritual uncle. So uh, I'm honored to be able to do this today. At least you didn't say crazy spiritual uncle. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, listen, the, the podcast is very, very, uh, I love this podcast because it gets us the opportunity to be able to speak to all those people that we've been able to run into along the road and also bring people like you that we've met. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, tell everyone kind of about you, where you're from, your family, your education, that sort of thing, and then maybe conclude that part with saying how we ran into each other. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, I want to say um, I, I'm, I am one of these people, you know, that you ran into. I'm not, you know, um, we, we going back, I was born in Puerto Rico. Um, my parents were um, first generation Puerto Rican U.S. citizens. Right. So uh, they're the first in our family to ever to come to, to the U.S. And, uh, and we did a lot of moving. We grew up kind of all up and down the East Coast. We, you know, I think by the time I moved out, I moved out at the age of 16. By the time I was 16, I had moved 15 times. And, wow. uh, and so that's, that's across four or five different states and two or three times within each state. And, uh, and so we, we moved a lot. We moved a lot from families' houses to other families' houses, um, from apartments to homes. Um, you know, we started life in a very kind of generic, normal way. You know, we had a two income family. Um, and also what I would say now was a two income lifestyle, which there some, sometimes it doesn't have to be that way. It can, you know, you can, you can do things a little bit wiser. And um, then really overnight things, things sort of changed for us. You know, we, I uh, remember being the, at the age of eight or nine and um, I'll never forget the day mom walked in and said, Hey, you guys got to prepare yourselves. Our divorce papers were signed. And uh, all of a sudden we went from living in, in what was a very nice three bed, two bath home in Daytona beach, Florida, um, to moving into a very not so nice rental property, um, right next to the train tracks, our whole house would shake. And I remember thinking, man, what, what's kind of going on. It just kind of seemed like it happened overnight. And, um, you know, our, that's really where, you know, the refining in my life kind of started at a very young age is when things kind of started to, to go south. Prior to that, everything was kind of your, your classic, you know, American childhood. You know, mom and dad worked. We had a babysitter. We'd come home. We'd play games. We'd do homework. We'd go to bed. And then, you know, kind of just seemingly overnight that, that changed. And um, there was a night where my brother and I were sat down on the porch of that rental property and we were asked, you know, who do, who do we want to live with? And uh, it was one of those defining moments in my childhood where I was, I was, I was heartbroken, you know, 
no eight year old or nine year old should ever have to make that decision. And uh, naturally, everything we knew <clears throat> was in the United States, and and uh, and so we decided to stay with my dad, and uh, and and mom sort of would end up leaving right after that, and that would strain our relationship for the next couple of years. You know, God would slowly restore that as I got older and as I found the Lord, but um, those were a hard couple of years. You know, yeah. we returned to New Jersey. I've mostly lived in New Jersey, but. Um, we've moved a lot in within New Jersey, but you know, when, when mom left, dad came back to New Jersey and, um, you know, we moved back in with an uncle and for the next two or three years, we slept on his living room floor. Um, one right next to the other, we had three air mattresses. I remember every night we had this Tupperware bin, we'd take them out and one next to another, we would blow them up and we would, you know, sleep next to each other for, you know, the next two or three years. And I remember thinking like, you know, especially as a young, as a young kid, as kind of a young man, you know, not even knowing God at that time, um, man, is this like, is this life, you know, is this, is all of this crazy and is all of this suffering is all of this struggle and heartache and circumstances, this life, you know, and I remember asking that at a young age and, uh, so yeah, for the next two or three years, we would live there. Um, you know, I would move out at 16 and um, I would uh, move into a property actually that was owned by the church. I had just met the Lord and there was a, there was a room open. And I said, I said to my dad, I said, Hey, how would you feel if I moved out? And I think he looked at me like I was crazy. And so I emancipated myself as a minor. Um, a great man of God in the church said, uh, Hey, I will, I will take on guardianship. And uh, I don't think he fully understood that at the time. And, and then we're at the courthouse signing papers and he's like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? <laughs> but uh, man, God just put the right people in my life. And, um, you know, and, and that's really where my personal journey started was when I met the Lord and I moved out at 16. Um, you know, prior to that, you know, dad, after he left our uncle's house, you know, did his best. He was a single dad. He worked two or three jobs, wasn't around much. Um, you know, unfortunately we, you know, we're, we lost a couple of homes and apartments and, uh, and I just, I, I remember getting to that point where I said, you know what, I would rather live and suffer based on my own decisions and my own, you know, and, and experience my own consequences than someone else's. And, uh, and so we had that conversation. I would go on to move out and, uh, and start really my journey with Jesus, but with the church as well. And that's where we would eventually run into each other. I think I was 16. That was the first year I think you came. Wow. And wow. so I just think it was this really, you know, now I look back and I remember thinking, you know, and I thought to myself, man, that was like, that was God timing, you know, that, that first FLE um, set me up for success, you know, and, and I often wonder if I didn't move out, would I have heard it with the same ears? And I don't, yeah. I don't know if I, if I would, or I wouldn't have. Um, but the fact that I did, I just think was God's, you know, kind of God's ordained timing. So I think that's um, something that I've learned along the way is uh, I love the parable of the four soils that Jesus shares. And, you know, three of the soils are not good. You know, you have the shallow soil, the thorny soil, the rocky soil, but then you have the fertile soil. And so I, I don't take it personally when somebody listens to what I'm teaching and they don't go <laughs> run out and apply it immediately because I know the cares of life can choke it out. But you actually had fertile soil that day. And yeah. a lot of that is because you had emancipated yourself. You were feeling the full weight and burden of those financial challenges of being emancipated. And so you move out at 16. Tell, t like, let's take a snapshot. How many finance classes had you had at age 16 when you emancipated yourself? Zero. Okay. And uh, my wife and I often talk about how that's such a lapse in, in kind of the world and the education system today. It's, you know, you, there's the part of you that's like, man, is it, is it designed to fail? I don't know. But I, at that point in my life, zero. And, uh, and I said this, I've said this to people in the past, you know, the thing about finances is you'll learn one way or another, you know, the context of your circumstances will teach you about finances. You'll mm -hmm. live with scarcity. You'll live with a mindset of lack. You'll live with a mindset of, you know, poverty and never enough and paycheck to paycheck. If that's what you grow up seeing and no one's educating you, 
you know? Okay. And so that was my mindset really about money growing up was, oh, this is just kind of something you struggle with. And I mean, you just kind of deal with it. And I think that's something really important. Uh, Damon Johns, the uh, one of the sharks, right? In Shark Tank, uh, wrote a book called The Power of Broke. And talks mm. about how when people have grown up broke, how they're willing to hustle at a level that he's just observed that people who grew up without scarcity, without lack, they may they may lack that ability to bear down and and hump up against the challenges simply because the power of broke forces you to take risks, forces you to, t- to view things differently. So you know you when I think it's something that I want all of our podcast listeners to hear. Uh, you have, if you have kids, uh, your kids are along for the ride you're taking them on, Mm -hmm. right? The financial ride you're taking them on the, the relational ride that you're taking them on. And I'll never forget a day that I was going to go watch a Disney movie with my, my oldest. She was a little kid at the time. Disney had a movie called inside out and, you know, I'm going to a Disney movie, man. It's going to be awesome. And Inside out <laughs> turns out to be what type of memories are you making? Are they core memories? Uh, are they sad memories, memories of joy, memories of happiness, memories of sadness, anger, frustration, humiliation, shame? And I walked away with all this introspective look at saying, hey, this parenting job is way more than just successfully raising a child alive at the age of 18. It's what you're mm. putting in them. And so, you know, Pastor Luis is sharing this here, you know, that he experienced normalcy until the marriage relationship fell apart. And then it introduced poverty, lack, scarcity, and a mindset. So you, you emancipate, your, emancipate yourself at 16. Are you still in school? I was still in school. Yep. And, and the, you know, the type of emancipation was a guardianship program. And so basically what I was, what I had to do was, say, hey, here is someone who is willing to take on that responsibility. Um, and I had the conversation with that person prior to make it clear, hey, I had every intention on taking care of myself. And, you know, I just, I needed you there as, you know, last case support. Um, and he was, you know, this incredible man. I got it. We're still very good friends today um, that I'm just so grateful for. But yes, I was still in high school. Um, it was my junior going into my senior year. At this point, I'd been to three high schools. And uh, I went back to the school I went to middle school for. So I, w- I graduated from a school called Clearview. And uh, and I'll never forget, you know, there were moments where, you know, I didn't have a car and uh, I lived on my own. And I if I if I couldn't get a hold of someone, I would walk. And, you know, thankfully, I had a couple of good friends that I just met in church and, you know, they would take me to school. And uh, and I got a job at the deli down the street. Praise the Lord. <laughs> And, uh, you know, would, would do the closing shift so I could go to school and, you know, did that for the for the year of high school and um, and then would work with my uh, with my brother actually at a warehouse. Um, I took a gap year after high school prior to going to, to Bible school first. So I went to Bible college. You know, that was kind of a journey in and of itself financially. Uh, I was a waiter, worked nights, uh, worked weekends part time um, with a couple of other other places. And I just kind of paid as I went, figured it out. A lot of moments along the way where, you know, I fasted more than maybe, (laughs) maybe I wanted to, but, you know, unintentional fasting. Uh (laughs) Yeah. Unintentional fasting, man, you know, and, uh, and, and I just remember thinking it all throughout the journey, you know, and applying the principles along the way, Joe, that I had heard you teach and have gone back at this point two or three times to hear you teach every year that you've come. And, uh, and just keeping that in front of me, you know, even if I felt like I wasn't progressing, I was very intentional about not wanting to regress. Mm. And I think that's really the, one of the things that you bring to the table that I, I don't think people always maybe say to you is, Hey, even if my life isn't getting exponentially better right away, it's also not getting exponentially worse or falling further behind, which is, a, which is pretty common for people, you know, wow. with, when they don't have a plan. Um, you know, there's this world today where they get frustrated when things don't change overnight. And so they just don't even try. And then they don't realize, but my life's actually getting worse overnight, little by little, instead of better over time, little by little. That's a great line. You know, not regressing. That's just as important as progressing. That's really good. 
And I so, tell young guys all the time, hey, it's better to live in a neutral position, you know, and have the ability to move forward at any time than to have to start from, you know, the reverse or, or you know, further back just to get back to neutral, you know. I love that. So you went to the financial learning experience. You heard the weekend messages uh, early on. Was there a particular phrase? Was there a particular tool that you learned of that that helped you take your first steps to truly start prospering? Yeah, I think, you know, from a few different perspectives, number one, biblically, you know, I remember the first time you taught on uh, Proverbs 21.5, you know, the plans of the diligent lead to prosperity as surely as haste leads to waste. Um, that verse, man, if I was going to get a verse tattooed, not that I think I would, but <laughs> <laughs> that verse is so applicable to everything. It's not just finances. It's your marriage. It's, it's a business. You know, it's raising kids, you know, be diligent, have a plan. And God promises that you'll succeed in that thing. Success looks different, right? It's not, it doesn't always look linear. Um, but that was the first time biblically I had heard someone teach about finances in a way that made sense to me. Wait, you're saying if I write down a plan and I do my best to stick to it and it honors God, I'm not doing anything crazy, right? Um, that over time that, you know, you'll see the fruit of that, man, I can do that, you know? So that was from a biblical perspective. And then of course, all the tools that you provide, you know, at that time, I didn't know about 0% interest credit cards, you know, and, and, you know, enrolling, you know, I, I've always paid off balances, but, but opening a new one after 18 months, get your credit high, keep your u- utilization rate low. Um, you know, all these things that I would learn over time, which, you know, when I got married at 22, 23, <clears throat> I had excellent credit, you know, in the, you know, just shy of the 800s, if not in the 800s. And so things like that, that I didn't realize would help me five, six, seven years down the road started to help me. Um, so things like that, obviously so when learning, you met your bride, um, tell her about your bride's name. My, my wife's name is Rachel. We have two amazing boys. Um, awesome. one is three, the other is one and they are man, just the sweetest, um, so, crazy. So, so when you and Rachel met, did you say, hi, yeah. my name is Luis. I have an 800 credit score. Is that what you said? <laughs> that would have been a great flex. <laughs> Thankfully, you know, she grew up in a very well, uh, well-to-do home, incredible family, and uh, set her up for great success too. You know, th- here's the opposite, right? She was raised and taught those things. And and now I, I had to learn those things and we merged those two things together when we got married. So when we got married, her parents put all of her student loans on you know, on, on a shared program, paid them off. And she had a higher credit score than I did, you know, so talk about, you know, setting up your kids for success. Right. Um, you know, and, and I understand not everyone can do that. You know, her parents are hardworking and, you know, they, they were able to do that for her. Um, but you know, to, to not only do it for her, but in, in, a, in some way include her so that she would actually personally benefit from it. Mm. I think it's such a neat thing I want to do for my kids. That's so, awesome. But yeah, it would have been great flex if I started with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's, it, it, you know, I've heard some of your story and I had this great uh, opportunity to view a testimony video that was shared with the entire church here when I was with you guys a few months ago. Um, so share with all of our podcast listeners, you know, your first big giant financial decision that you made that you said, Hey, I've moved beyond the scarcity play. I'm actually progressing. What was your first big step, big financial decision? Yeah, that that would, I, I, if I could go back, I think that would be the moment we, well, we would have bought our house, but really when I decided to get married, um, I think that was a faith step and, uh, you know, Hey, Joe, I don't know if the lights just went off here. I'm sorry. Do, would you need to edit that out if I turn this back That's on? All right. Well, all right. <laughs> don't okay. want your viewers to be confused. Environmental concerns. Um, so, <laughs> we, uh, so we had just gotten, uh, engaged and, and by the way, I, again, going back to what I said, maybe not where I wanted to be at the time we got engaged that I was 21 And, uh, and I still didn't have, you know, a lot of money in the bank, but I knew this was the woman I wanted to spend my life with. And I said, I said, God's going to make a way. And if we got to get married in a backyard, we're going to get married in a backyard. And so I made that step, not being fully ready for everything that's going to come, but who is. And so we, uh, you know, got married and we moved into a small rental property. Someone owned on the church 
And uh, it was a great little, I think, seven or 800 square foot apartment, praise the Lord. And uh, it was just right for the two of us. And uh, with, you know, I said to my, to my wife when we got married, I said, yeah, you know, we'll be here for two or three years. And then, you know, hopefully we'll have enough money to, to save and, and move forward. And, uh, and so here comes the big decision. Within six months of being married, God opens this opportunity for a foreclosure um, not far from us. And, uh, and we, again, not, not fully prepared for it, but said, God, we're going we're gonna to open the door. And if you shut it, fine. But if, if you leave it open, we're going to walk through it. And so um, we, we found a foreclosure for about $70,000. And uh, Pastor Joe, it was a two bed, one bath, and the owners had 11 cats. Praise the Lord. You can imagine what that <laughs> smelled like. And uh, it had lattice walls that were exposed. It had a concrete slab in the middle of the dining room that we had to destroy. Uh, it had electrical issues. You know, it was a work of and a labor of love. And uh, man, we were able to, to purchase that and put a little bit of money into it that we were able to mortgage. And uh, man, we turned it into this beautiful first, you know, first time home that we were able to really benefit from at, on the sale of it um, down the road. And so there it was, you know, it was a, it was a scary thing, you know, but I think there are moments where God is, you know, the greatest blessings look like the most work. And uh, that's something we learned very quickly. Um, you know, everyone wants God to bless them with the move in ready, five bed, three bath home that you don't have to touch. And, and that was just not what we wanted. We said, God, you open the door and we'll do the work and, and we're ready to do whatever it takes to, you know, build a life. And uh, we, you know, we had, we, we, we made such tremendous equity on that first sale that it's really kind of set up our journey, um, you know, for really for the next couple of years. So um, we're really excited about what that was able to produce, but it was a scary moment. You know, it's, sure. it was that you're young, you're married. And, and, uh, but you know, what's neat is in, in the ways that my family couldn't help me personally growing up, what I did learn was hard work. And I learned mm -hmm. to use my hands and my dad was blue collar and I grew up working blue collar with him. And it's funny because, you know, when, uh, you know, when I would work with him, I'd say, man, I'm going to college, forget this, you know, and then I would go to graduate college and go and finish my four year in business. And then I came out and started a side business doing, uh, blue, you know, doing some, some, uh, some handyman work. <laughs> so all that to just kind of go back to where, you know, God started and, you know, to, to your train of not despising days of humble, you know, humble beginnings, you know, we called that little side business, humble home. And uh, wow. it was such a blessing to us. And, uh, you know, it taught us more of how to, you know, build and remodel and, you know, and do things in our homes. So we would help my in-laws um, do two or three properties over the next couple of years. That's some kind of their side thing. You know, they, they flip properties. So we have learned so much from them. And, uh, and so we were able to do that for ourselves. We, we then would move on to purchase our now current home again, another Another rehab uh, needed some love, but man, we are living in it now and, and it's, it's beautiful and it's, it's more than we could have ever asked or imagined, but it was a lot of hard work, you know, and I think a lot of people don't always see that, you know, the greatest blessings look like the most work. That, that's such a great line. Um, I'm reminded of something Bishop T.D. Jake said, is many people are praying for a table and chairs and God has given them a treat. That's good. You know, the table and chairs are in the tree, but there's work to get out of it. And, That's so true. And, and I think about what you just shared about working on another person's side project, another person's flip. You know, we talk about this verse all the time, it's Proverbs 15, 22, that plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Mm. A lot of times counsel is not going and getting lunch together. Counsel is doing a flip together, right? you know, because it's in the midst of that, that you find where the water leak is and you find the cracked foundation and you find the concrete in the kitchen. And so the question I think everybody wants to know is, did you leave the concrete in the middle of the kitchen of the first house? <laughs> did you adopt no, any of we, the 11 cats? We, oh, it was, you know what? It was so devastating because the house had original hardwoods. And we had to smash that concrete with a uh, with a sledgehammer, and it and unfortunately it ruined enough of the floor where I said we got to we got to go right over top of these hardwoods, man, and it broke my heart. 
So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry to disappoint all the hardwood lovers out there, there but go. man, it was a you labor. My heart's of- broken right now. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that I was struck by when they were sharing this testimony video, and I'm go- I'm going to add it to the end of this this podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to watch it. But I was struck by how beautiful the work is in the home that you're living in. Uh, and I know you, you guys did uh, that. And that's a gifting that God has given you this eye for detail, this eye for design. And I think it's interesting that a lot of times people find their calling, they find their gifting in the midst of working. I love mm-hmm. what you're saying. The greatest blessings look like the most work. But when you love it, when you find out you have a gift for it, uh, I was listening to a podcast, uh, the Bigger Pockets podcast. It's a real estate podcast. And he was talking mm-hmm. about work. When you're viewing work, a specific activity, a specific task, does it feel heavy or does it feel light? And he's saying, yeah. I'm not saying how complex is the work because some complex work feels very light for people because it's their gifting. Right. If it's heavy, hey, that's where you need to bring in help. I suspect that if I ask you, how does home reno feel to you? Does it feel heavy or light? I suspect for you, it feels lighter than it does for me because it feels <laughs> extremely heavy for me. Yeah, we we love it, man. And it is so funny you say that. It's so true. Like it overwhelms my wife. She's the designer, right? She she has the eye, but she cannot step foot in the house. It 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 freaks her out. It overwhelms her. Whereas, you know, I'm I'm just the project manager in my head. You know what I mean? Like I know, and and you're right, it recharges you. Um, It's my outlet, you know? And I think that's where a lot of people understand your grace, you know, and and it doesn't have to look a certain way. I think a lot of people feel like they have to have this gift, you know, what's in your hand. I always have heard people preach that message, Um, you know, and it's funny because it was, it was growing up the thing I I resented, you know, I, I kind of resented that I had to, work this blue collar stuff with my dad and work in a warehouse and like repair things in a warehouse. And, uh, and I had no idea what was in my hand would later be so, so valuable. What you know, a gift. It's a, yeah. And I, it's, and it's fun. It's, you know, it's, it's challenging. You, it requires problem solving. And I think for me, I, I'm so blessed to your point about mentors. I am so blessed to have in-laws who have been there, done that and have really taken me under their wing have taught us, have allowed us to come alongside of them without carrying, you know, too much of the liability or any, any liability really on some of those projects um, and just to learn. You know, I think a lot of people, they're they're eager to earn before they learn. And uh, I was just, you know, I'm all about taking the, any opportunity I can to learn, you yeah. know, because when it comes time for you to carry the risk and carry the liability, uh, that education and that experience is going to be far more valuable um, than, you know, the, uh, the financial investment at the time, because it'll help you make the right financial investment. So I, yeah, I, I'm great. I, I think it's amazing. You know, uh, one of the things that I think I want everybody in the podcast to hear is the can do attitude that there is a better, there's a better end and that you can have a hand in that. I think when you're doing these rehab projects, when you're doing these restoration projects, you probably get an unending number of sermon illustrations you know, <laughs> on how it's the redemptive work of the gospel, right? That what is yeah. broken, what is fractured, what is worn out is renewed, refreshed, restored yes. uh, in the hands of the master, right? Mm-hmm. And that, that's just fantastic. So uh, you've been able to flip a house while you lived in it. Yeah. Uh, did you live in it for at least two years in a day? We were in there for three years, but, uh, but I knew the two years in a day rule thanks to you. So I appreciate it. <laughs> so, so being able to live in a house, if it's been your primary residence for two years or longer, uh, the two of the last five years, you can take any gain on sale and it's tax free up to $500,000 right. for a couple. And so yes. now you're in a second home, you've yep. renovated it. It's beautiful. What do you see happening in the future because of all this knowledge you have? Well, what's really cool, so if I can share a little bit more of the context of the story, you know, when I left home at 16, it wasn't on the best terms with with my dad. Um, There was a lot of resentment there, a lot of anger, a lot of things that I hadn't understood about the divorce and why we were where we were. 
in life. And so I would carry that for years. You know, I don't want people to think my journey has been perfect. And I've, you know, lived this perfect, you know, even as a pastor, I've, I've had my battles. And uh, when, when my wife and I sold our first home, our second, the house we were supposed to purchase fell through. Hmm. So it was pretty, it was an ugly journey for a little bit. We were supposed to rent for a month and we ended up renting for an entire year, one year to the date um, actually. And so we, we were under contract for a home for almost five months, which, you know, is unusual. And it, we were trying to force a square peg in a round hole and we realized God's peace is not in this. And so we were, we kind of got out of that situation. And I said to my wife, I said, I said, I need a break. At that time we had looked at 30, 30 plus homes. I think um, this was just, you know, two years ago when everything was crazy. And, uh, and I was just feeling a little bit defeated, you know? And so I, we took five months off from looking. And then, uh, and then in October of that year, um, my wife said, Hey, I really think we should go see this home. And I said, all right, if you think we should go see it, we'll go see it. And, uh, and we walked through our current home <clears throat> at the time and it needed a lot of love. And, uh, and we're walking around and she says, well, what do you think? Do you love it? I said, yeah, I love it. She's like, well, you don't look like you love it. And I said, my dad lives one street over. Hmm. And I, it was this moment where I knew this was the, the house that God had for us. And I called my dad when we closed and I said, dad, I just bought a house. He said, that's great, son. We're at, I said, it's one street over from you. And, um, and mind you, our journey at this point, there was a lot of bitterness still in anger and just unresolved situations. And my dad would spend the next two and a half months, three or four nights a week with me, laboring in love, swinging hammers. And in, in that house restored our relationship. It restored, you know, so much of the, the brokenness and the pain. And we just had conversations and when I would get tired, he'd say, come on, this is for the grandkids. We got to get this done. It's for the grandkids. And man, I'm getting emotional just talking about it. And uh, it was the restoration of God, man, you know, and, uh, Lord. and uh, yeah, so I think there's this real power in just, you know, um, not being quick to make a decision, you know, just because you, in the natural, it feels like, man, you know, this is crazy. We've got to get a house. We had a second baby on the way. It would have been easy to make an impulsive decision. And uh, I think that's where, you know, your trust in the Lord has to come in, uh, that he has a bigger plan in, in mind. Here I was just trying to restore a house and he was trying to restore a relationship, Ooh. you know, and, he, you know, and he uh, and, and now my dad comes over, you know, once, maybe twice a week, sees the grandkids. We have dinner. I mean, I couldn't have fabricated that, you know. And so um, what you're asking is what's next. And th this is what I think is so cool. I remember when I left home, I, I had a conversation with my brother and I, and I said to him, you know, at 15, 16, I said, Hey, I know I need to go. And I know I need to do things, you know, in my life, right. And get ahead. I said, because I know there's going to come a day where dad's going to need it, you know? And, uh, and so my wife and I actually just over the last two weeks, since you left, actually, Joe, ironically, we had a conversation here about rental properties. Um, my wife and I just started, um, you know, entertaining rental properties and we've been speaking with our lender and, uh, and we were basically given the green light with our plan. And, uh, and we know that this is the start of us developing a portfolio, hopefully, you know, a real estate portfolio, um, that can benefit my dad and, you know, in his, in his elderly age, you know, as he, as he gets a little bit older, you know, he, he doesn't really, he's not in a position right now. Um, you know, where he, he, he knows what's next. And, uh, and I think what's so cool is, you know, looking back when I said that at 16 and to be in a position now where someone is saying, Hey, you can start to do that. Um, is so it's so rewarding. And, you know, we're thinking long-term about, wow, this, this is not only going to be a blessing to us, but it, you know, we're bringing our family, you know, back, you know, we're There's bringing nothing our family better than that. That's and that's awesome. so, yeah. I mean, that's been the really cool thing the last couple of weeks is like, wow, we're actually, I think we're actually going to be able to do this, you know, to sit down with someone, a professional and for them to not say, well, you have to do this. You have to do that. You, you know, <laughs> for them to say, man, you've already, you've done the heavy lifting already. Um, you have the green light. Now, mind you, we're, we're still going to be patient. We're, we're going to probably save a little bit more. Um, but to have that green light and know, man, if the right opportunity comes, we can, we can move on it. I think it's just so cool. That's awesome. That fires me up. You, you know, uh, it reminds me of a statement that I heard a, a pastor share once that said, do right now, what, 10 years from now, you'll look back and say, I'm so glad I did that back then. That's and true. So you're kind of in that 10 year window since you told your brother, Hey, I got to go do something. It's time for me mm -hmm. to go progress. 
and you emancipated yourself, what what is one thing you would go back and tell your teenage self? What would what would you say to sixteen yeah. year old Louise? <laughs> um, I think I would. <clears throat> yeah, I think I would say be kind to yourself. You know, I know that might be a little bit of a, you know, I don't know if that's surface or deep level response, but be kind to yourself. You know, I think we we're very good at internally destroying our own abilities and confidence and gifts and creativity and what God's put in our hand. You know, we like to compare it to what other people have in their hand. And uh, I spent a long time just trying to, you know, thrive for the sake of making a point and not a difference. And uh, when that shifted, it shifted because I started to say, God, thank you for being present with me through this journey. I couldn't have fabricated it the way it's worked out. By the grace of God, go I, you know, and I would have saved myself a lot of self-defeat, self-defeating behavior, self you know, uh, offensive thoughts towards, you know, just where I was, you know, I think a lot of people, maybe they're listening today and, and that's where they are. You know, they're, they're upset with the situation. Maybe they've put themselves in. Um, what I would hope to say to them is be kind to yourself, you know, forgive yourself maybe of what you had to do to survive in the moment, you know? Um, and I know for some people, that credit yeah. card's maxed out because they were, it's an emotional decision and they're hurt and they're broken and, and they tried to fix it with something. Um, and so forgive yourself of that. Be kind to yourself, but start somewhere, you know, start somewhere and, you know, be kind to yourself along the way. It's better to, it's better to move one inch forward a day than, you know, one foot back a year. And I think it's just, it, don't underestimate what you can do over 10 years. Don't be overwhelmed by what you can do in one year. Um, yeah. you know, I love that. Just going to your statement, you know, maybe the win today is to just not regress. So that's good. right. Yeah. Stop regressing. Stop yeah, regressing. Man, I really yeah. appreciate that. That's so powerful. Um, man, I I'm personally moved, uh, by you sharing your story with your father that fires me up. Uh, saying you. I was trying to restore a house and God was trying to restore a relationship. Get fired up. There's okay. nothing greater than that. Hey, Amen. Our, our, uh, our, I do want to say thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your story. Is there any last word that you would like to share? <clears throat> no, I mean, if, if there's anything I, I can say, it's I'm going to point it back to every, the work you're doing, Joe, um, to your listeners who just started. Maybe they're on the journey. Um, stay th faithful, stay committed to that. You know, I didn't do anything that was novel or new. I think I just, I listened to your plan. Um, I, I read the word, I believed it for myself and, you know, and so to those who are just starting or on that process, you can do it, you know, stay faithful, keep moving forward. That's awesome. And I would say you did two other things. You surrounded yourself with wise people, people, yes. listen to them and you found a good wife. And as it says yeah. in the Bible, who can find a good one for her price is worth far more than rubies. Get fired Amen up. <laughs> Zechariah <Yeah>. 410 <laughs> is our verse for today. And it says, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. What is the Amen. work you need to begin? I love that verse. Uh, so, hey, in our next episode, we're going to continue our You Ask For It series. We're going to talk about how to end your year well. How do I end my year well? We're going to talk about things you can do to land the plane really well at the end of this year and be positioned to do well next year. You never have to recover from a great start. Hey, if you like today's episode, help us get this podcast to other people who could benefit. You can do that by rating our podcast, leaving a review. If you're watching on YouTube, click the subscribe button, click the thumbs up, and leave a comment. Uh, how has this story from Pastor Luis impacted you? What are you going to do as a result? We'd love to hear from you. And if you've implemented one of our tips, please, please, please share your success story with us. This podcast is powered by your success. Email it to us at info at IWasBrokenI'mNot.com. That's info at IWasBrokenI'mNot.com. Or you can share it with us on any of our social media platforms. Hey, uh, don't despise your small beginnings. Have a great week, everybody. Get fired up.
Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Monday Money Tip Podcast, presented by I Was Broke, Now I'm Not. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review and subscribe. And for more great content and to stay up to date, visit IWBNIN.com. We'll catch you next time.